Uh, it's all right. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. Well, there's just two of you at this point. Um, right. So are there any questions or concerns pertaining to anything we did yesterday? Okay, so if not, just to quickly remind you, we proved Hall's theorem, uh, right, which gives you necessary and sufficient conditions for a graph to have an X saturating matching, where X is one of the two colored classes, right? And uh, from this, you can easily deduce necessary and sufficient conditions for a graph, bipartite graph, to uh, have a perfect matching. So all of this is about bipartite graphs, right? And um, we saw as an application that every regular bipartite graph is a perfect matching. Well, we didn't see it. Uh, it was left to you as an exercise. It's an easy exercise. So please do it yourself. Uh, just to give you a spoiler alert, uh, later in the course, uh, we will prove that in the case of non-bipartite graphs, all three regular graphs have a perfect matching so long as they are two edge connected okay so that will prove next module and we ended with the following question um at the end of yesterday's lecture how do you convince someone that a matching is indeed a maximum matching right so let's start with that right so Supposing you have a graph G, let's just ask the question more generally. So you have a graph G, not necessarily bipartite. And um, sorry, that's not how I write it. I write it as G is a graph. And you've got a matching M, right? The question is, um, how do you convince someone that M is a maximum matching. Right? And that is the same as saying, can we find good upper bounds for the size of a matching? Are there good upper bounds? for alpha prime G, the matching number of a graph, right? Good. So it turns out that there is a nice concept, as you can tell by the title of the lecture that I've uh, chosen, matchings versus vertex covers, right? So it turns out that there is a nice notion which provides a, an upper bound for alpha prime of G. Right? So let me define uh, this concept. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, let me just start. A vertex cover of a graph G is a set of vertices that covers all the edges. What do I mean by that? Is a subset um, S of the vertex set such that One way to think about it, it S covers, or if you like, hits each edge of G. Uh, what do I mean by this uh, way of praising it? Each edge E has at least one end in the set S. Of 
Um, as an aside, before we get into the examples and all, um, well, maybe let's start with a quick example. Um, let's take a small bipartite graph, right? Can someone tell me what is a smallest vertex cover in this graph? How do I pick a set of vertices as small as possible so that every edge um, is covered by that set, one and three, right? So for example, you could pick these two vertices, or you could put two and four, right? In other words, they're basically the color classes of this bipartite graph. Observe that in a bipartite graph, each color class, if you have a bipartite graph gx, y, then each of x and y is a vertex cover, right? Because every edge has to have at least one end in x or in y. Uh, one end in x and the other end in y, right? So each of x and y is actually a vertex cover. Okay, good. Um, so we have one small example here. Um, so if, in fact, more generally, if gxy is a bipartite graph, then each of x and y is a vertex cover, right? OK. Um, well, so generally, I've noticed that people, including myself to some degree, don't really like the term vertex cover, because what you're really covering is you're covering edges using vertices. Uh, so if you were to follow the standard naming uh, policies in combinatorics, you would call it an edge cover, actually. Um, but anyways, the name is stuck there for a few centuries now. So we are going to stick to vertex cover, which is the more common terminology in the literature. Bondi and Murthy um, don't use the term vertex cover. They call it a cover or a covering. But then they have also used cover and covering for something else, which we discussed in the beginning of this course. OK? But we will stick to vertex cover. OK? Um, great. So right, so I claim that if a graph has a vertex cover, of a certain size, then a matching cannot be any bigger than a vertex cover. So let's see, claim. If G is any graph, M is a matching, and S is a vertex cover, then I claim that the cardinality of the matching is no more the, the cardinality of the vertex cover. Does anybody see why this should be true? I will give you a few seconds to think about the definitions and see if you can come up with a quick argument why this should be true. Let me make you make a drawing for you. Supposing this is my matching in the graph. And then there are a bunch of other vertices which are not matched. I claim that a vertex cover must have at least five vertices. Anyone see why? My matching here is uh, five edges. So this is an example where the cardinality of the matching is equal to five. I claim that 
any vertex cover must have at least five vertices if there are less than five at least one of those edges must cannot be covered because those edges only have the matching vertices with them so every at, at least one of those matching vertices must be there in the vertex cover that's right or to put it slightly differently if you call these edges e1 e2 up to e well five in this case notice that any vertex cover must contain at least one of ui and vi for each i because that's the definition of vertex cover for every single edge it must have at least one end in the vertex cover which means at least one of ui and vi uh, where ei is equal to ui vi has to be in the vertex cover right so that's the proof as per this example each um uh, for each i one of ui and vi um belongs to s right where m is a set of edges ei equal to ui vi or So you're done. Okay, so that is an upper bound for the size of any matching, right? In other words, if I give you a, um, well, let's look at one quick consequence. Here is a graph where you have a vertex cover of size two, as was pointed out, one, one and three is a vertex cover. And you also have a matching of size two. So this implies that that is a maximum matching and this is a minimum vertex cover, right? So an observe corollary of this, um, well, I think it's called uh, proposition 16.7 is that if you have the same setting, G is your graph, M is your matching, S is your vertex cover. And if it so happens that the cardinality of M is equal to the cardinality of S, then M is a maximum matching. And S is a minimum vertex cover. Okay, is that clear? Uh, well, since we have a notation for the size of a maximum matching, why not have a notation for the size of a minimum vertex cover? It's another computational problem of interest. So let's say beta of G is the size of a minimum vertex cover in the graph G. And another way to uh, put this um, statement is to say that uh, alpha prime of G is less than equal to beta of G, right? Those are equivalent. Good. So of course the question arises, well, can we compute the size of a minimum vertex cover, just like can we compute the matching number, the stability number, the clique number, so on. It turns out that vertex covers are closely related to another concept that you've already seen in this course. Um, so let's think about it for a second. Supposing I give you a vertex cover in a graph, Supposing I tell you that this is a vertex cover. Let's say S is a vertex cover. Okay. 
then what can you say about s bar no i just inside s bar exactly so what does that mean what is s bar independent set right an independent set or as we are calling it a stable set right so observe that if in fact it's if and only if s is a vertex cover if and only if the complement is um a stable set right so if you were able to compute uh, beta of g then you would also be able to compute um alpha of g which is the stability number of a graph right alpha prime is the matching number of the graph right so this implies that uh computing beta of g is as difficult as computing the stability number alpha of g of a graph g right so we don't have much uh, hope in computing this upper bound on alpha prime g in general right in general we uh, we don't have any hope right but it turns out that in the case of bipartite graphs we actually do we actually can compute um the size of a minimum vertex cover and the reason for that is that in the case of bipartite graphs uh this is an equality so the um size of a minimum vertex cover is exactly the size of a maximum matching and we know although we are not being into the algorithmic parts too much uh we know that we can compute um the matching number so we can also compute beta of g so in the case of bipartite graphs we may efficiently compute beta of g and the reason for that is the famous konig egelberry theorem which says that these two quantities are equal okay so <clears throat> this is um theorem 8.32 in the text because they um they do a proof using lp linear programming but we are going to see a graph theoretical proof so this is the famous konig egelberry result and it says that if g is a bipartite graph then alpha prime of g is equal to beta of g so this just remind you size of a maximum matching and this is size of a minimum vertex cover okay yet so let's prove this are there any questions or concerns um so far So the proof is going to be very similar to what we did yesterday, um, right? So what um, yesterday we proved Hall's theorem. Let me just uh, take you quickly through that. We started from a certain vertex U, which was unmatched by a maximum matching, right? 
So we took a maximum matching um, and we wanted to find a deficient set. Right? We had assumed that there is no matching saturating uh, X and then uh, we want to find a deficient set. Right? So we started with this unmatched vertex U and we constructed this set Z, which is a set of all reachable vertices using M alternating paths from U. Right? Um, and that gave us this particular drawing. Uh, just to remind you, in this drawing, we um, the neighborhood of the top set was exactly the bottom set, which means all the edges go, either they go from the top left to the bottom left, or they go from top right to bottom right, or they go from the uh, bottom left to the top right. But there are no edges in the other diagonal. Right? OK. And this was crucial uh, to our proof. So we are going to do something similar. We are going to get a similar drawing, uh, a similar representation of our bipartite graph. And uh, it's going to be very similar to what we did yesterday. There's just a small difference, which is that instead of starting from a specific unmatched vertex, we are going to start from all the unmatched vertices. And we're going to look at all the reachable vertices using M alternating paths. OK, turns out that does the trick. OK, so um, let's say G is your bipartite graph. And uh, M is your maximum matching. We Our goal is to construct a vertex cover that has the same cardinality as M. OK. Um, right, and this will prove that it is indeed a minimum vertex cover and that alpha prime is equal to beta. Okay. So we're going to start something similar. Let's take all the um, M unsaturated vertices in one set. So let's say U, capital U, is the set of all, uh, OK, so let me call this, um, let's call this G x comma y, OK, is our bipartite graph. So we are already going to fix a bipartition because it doesn't hurt. So it's going to be the set of all M unsaturated vertices in the set X. OK, so supposing you have some vertices, I don't know, maybe four vertices. OK, and as usual, I'm going to draw X on the top and Y on the bottom. OK, and X is going to be my black vertices, and Y is going to be my white vertices. OK, so we're going to start from the set U, and we are going to consider all the vertices we can reach using M alternating paths from U. Now that I think of it, we could have actually done the same thing uh, in the previous proof. It's just that that proof works with a single vertex. Uh, because we are trying to show something easier, right? We are just trying to find a deficient set. Here we are trying to find a vertex cover whose cardinality is the same as a matching. So we need to do something slightly more sophisticated. But, um, so let's define the set Z. Z is a set of all vertices reachable from U by M alternating paths. OK. Um, good. So this will contain U in particular. Note that U is clearly a subset of Z because 
all vertices of D, U are reachable from U, right? And note that the vertices in Z, uh, except for U, they all have to be matched, right? Because otherwise you will get an M augmenting path and that's not possible because you have taken a maximum matching, right? From, maybe I should be more precise, from U, from some vertex in U, although it is clear that's what I meant. Okay, so let's say you get the set Z. So this is Z minus Z intersection X minus U, and this is Z intersection Y. Okay. Note that all vertices in Z minus U are M saturated since M is a maximum matching. Okay. Well, I claim that they basically have to be matched with each other. They can't be matched to the other side, Z complement. Okay, it's the same argument as yesterday. Let me first make a drawing and then let me see if I need to convince you. If you're already convinced, then I won't even bother. So I claim that, okay, maybe let me draw it like this. Let me put some red colored lines. So red is the matching edges, right? So. Uh, M is our matching, which is the red colored matching. Okay. I claim that the figure looks like this. Okay, so let me first make the drawing and let me ask you if you need to be convinced because if you don't, then I'm not going to spend time on it. Okay, so so there are some other vertices on this side. I want to convince you that the figure looks like this. All the vertices here. So this is um, this is Z bar intersection X, and this is Z bar intersection Y. Okay, these are black vertices. These are some white vertices and maybe some other white vertices. So my first claim is that this is what the drawing looks like. All the vertices in U, uh, sorry, in Z, except for the vertices in U are matched with each other. So they are matched and moreover, they are matched to some other vertex in the same set. And if you look at the complement Z bar, then all the vertices of Z bar intersection X are matched with some vertex in Z bar intersection Y. However, Z bar intersection Y may have additional vertices that are unmatched. This is my claim. Let's see. Um, let's look at the first part. So the first part is that all vertices of Z minus U are matched with each other. Is everybody convinced that this is true based on arguments similar to yesterday? So here are some claims. One, each vertex, uh, maybe let me make this drawing a bit smaller so that I can fit everything. So each vertex in Z intersection X minus U is matched with some vertex in Z intersection Y and vice versa. Uh, second claim, each vertex 
in z intersection z bar intersection x is matched with some vertex in z bar intersection y And there is a third claim I want to make, but I'll come to that later. So let's just look at these two claims. And uh, let me know if you need me to convince you about any of these. If you're already convinced, then we'll just move on. Okay, so I'll just say a few words. So the first observation is basically same reasoning as um, Hall's theorem proof. Okay. Okay, good. And the second part follows from the fact that we took U is the set of all unsaturated vertices in X. So that means all of the remaining vertices of X, that is Z bar intersection X, uh, they have to be saturated, right? So this follows from choice of the set U, right? Because those are all the unmatched vertices in X. So the remaining ones are matched. Okay, good. There is a last part I want to convince you about. Is uh, Can anybody see what we are going to do now to complete the proof? So I want to extract a vertex cover from this drawing, but I need one additional fact. Can anyone see that? I'll give you a small hint. Um, I claim that one of the following kinds of edges do not exist. Either there are no edges from the top left to the bottom right, or there are no edges from the bottom left to the top right. One of these statements is true. Anyone? Which of these two edges don't exist? Are they these edges or are they these edges? Supposing you have a path from U to some vertex, right? So that will look like this. This will be a matching edge, this will be a matching edge, and this will be a non-matching edge. So supposing you can get from some vertex U1 to some vertex V1 here. Now if there was an edge from here to the other side into Z bar intersection Y. Mm -hmm. Supposing there was some edge from V1 to Z bar intersection Y. Well, then you would take this path and include this edge and you would get an alternating path all the way up to this vertex W1. And so that vertex would have to be in the set Z, right? So which means that those edges cannot exist. So all the edges in this graph are either on the left or they are on the right, or they go from the bottom left to the top right but there are no edges from top left to bottom right. And now I claim that we can see here in this drawing 
a vertex cover which has the same size as the matching. Can anybody see this vertex cover? Can you give me a vertex cover whose size is the same as the size of the matching? Uh, Z intersection Y. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Z bar intersection X. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, those are going to be our two sets, right? So let's mark them with blue color. This set and this set. So let's call this our S, right? This is S intersect. Yeah, both of these together are S. I won't write down too much notation, right? <clears throat> so now observe that. Uh, let me write down the final observation that I did not write yet in the claim. So the third claim is that there are no edges from the top left, that was Z intersection X, to the bottom right, which is Z bar intersection Y. Okay? Yeah. And so the reason for this is otherwise um, some vertex in Z bar intersection Y is reachable from U by an M alternating path, right? And that is a contradiction because it contradicts the definition of Z, contradicts the definition of Z, right? And now this means that these, uh, the other two sets, Z intersection Y and Z bar intersection X, they form a vertex cover, right? Because every single edge in the graph has to have at least one end in one of these two sets. So from here, the set S, which is um, the bottom left, so that is Z intersection Y, union the top right, that is Z bar intersection X is a vertex cover and it follows from the previous two claims that this is exactly the size of the matching because from each edge of the matching you're picking exactly one vertex right um, and cardinality of s is equal to cardinality of m since we pick precisely one vertex from each edge in M. And that's it. That is your proof. Right, so it's um, very much similar to the proof of Halstein that we saw yesterday, except that um, going from a single vertex to a whole set U, I think it gave us some time to um, wrap the wrapper our heads around the same idea, right? So hopefully it has some utility. Good. Are there any questions or concerns? Anything in this proof that seems mysterious or seems it requires more explanation? Okay, if not, let's move on to, okay, um, no, let me complete this discussion. So in the case of bipartite graphs, these two quantities are the same, right? What about non bipartite graphs? Clearly, uh, it cannot be the same because we know one is efficiently computable and the other is not. So what's a small example of a non bipartite graph where this is not true? Can anybody give me a small 
non bipartite graph and an explanation of why this is not true. Well, let's just consider the smallest non bipartite graph we are aware of. So what's the size of a maximum matching here? It's one, right? That's the best you can do. And what is the size of a minimum vertex cover here? Well, you pick any one vertex. There is still one edge that you have not covered. So you have to pick at least one more vertex. And now you have covered all the edges, right? So beta of G is equal to two. Another small example is, let's say, one of my favorite graphs. The size of a maximum matching here is three, because there is a perfect matching. And what's the best you can do in a minimum vertex cover? Well, by the same argument as in this small graph, from each of these triangles, you will have to pick at least two vertices. Otherwise, you will not cover one edge of the triangle. Okay, and that turns out to be the best you can do. So you can pick two of these, and then for instance, you can pick two of these. And I think now you've covered all the edges. Right. Okay, so must pick two from each triangle. Okay, so definitely there's infinitely many examples when your graph is non-bipartite. Uh, and so this gives you an upper bound, but it's not a very useful upper bound in the case of non-bipartite graphs. Interestingly, alpha prime is still computable in non-bipartite graphs. And it turns out that vertex cover is not the right um, way to look at it. It turns out to be a correct way to look at it for bipartite graphs. But when you go to non bipartite graphs, it turns out that you need to um, find a notion that's different from vertex covers. So you can actually get a good upper bound, but it's not vertex covers. Okay, so that we will see in the next module. But for now, I want to switch to uh, edge colorings of graphs. And we are basically going to prove all the theorems there as applications of bipartite matchings. Right. So let's see if we can get started on this. Well, we'll again start with bipartite edge colorings, but it turns out that even non bipartite edge colorings is actually an application of bipartite matchings. Okay, so, so now we are basically um, looking at some topics in chapter 17 in the text. Right? We'll come back to chapter 16 when we study. On non bipartite matchings. And I think I'll spend uh, basically the entire last two, three weeks on non bipartite matchings. Okay, so recall edge colorings, right? Do I need to define things? Let me see. <clears throat> Okay, so maybe I'll just keep it super brief. So a K edge coloring of a graph G is a mapping uh, C. So this is the coloring and each edge of the graph is given one up to K colors. 
these are your colors, right? Um, and as you have discussed before, um, you may view this as basically a partition of the edge set, right? May be viewed as a partition E1, E2, up to EK of the edge set of the graph, right? Where each EI is the set of edges colored I. And it is proper. Notice that right now we are just talking about an arbitrary coloring. It is proper if adjacent edges receive distinct colors. And that is the same as saying that if you look at any set EI and its intersection with partial V, right? So in other words, if you look at any vertex V, then you will see exactly zero or one edges from the set EI at that vertex. So if you, red is your color, then at the vertex V, there should be at most one red colored edge. Okay. So in other words, this is zero or one for every vertex of the graph. And that basically means that EI is a matching, right? Good. So the point I want to make is that a graph G is a edge colorable If it admits, I feel like if it has, if it has a proper K edge coloring, and that is the same as saying um, that the edge set can be partitioned into K pairwise disjoint matchings. Uh, we need to add that uh, parts may be empty because a four coloring is also five coloring. Parts may be empty. Okay, good. Um, right, so this is just basic terminology that we have already seen uh, when we were doing vertex colorings and we were studying Tate's theorem. We also discussed edge colorings. Um, finally, the edge chromatic number chi prime of G. So remember, chi of g is the chromatic number or the vertex chromatic number of the graph. For the edge chromatic number, we're going to use chi prime of g. It is the minimum k for which g is k edge colorable. OK? Um, So yeah, so this is all I want to say today. Let's just um, get back to edge colorings tomorrow. And uh, we will discuss uh, lower bounds and upper bounds. Um, yeah, so the situation in the case of chromatic number turns out to be, um, in some sense, simpler than the situation in the case of uh, chromatic number. So the edge chromatic number turns out to be somewhat more um, um, let's say a bit easier to handle than the chromatic number one can say that in some sense uh, I'll make that precise tomorrow just to tell you uh, edge chromatic number is also called chromatic index in the literature 
but we will use a edge chromatic number instead. Okay, so let's continue from here tomorrow, and we will uh, see that for bipartite graphs, the edge chromatic number can actually be determined exactly. Okay. Any questions or concerns? Okay, if not, then I'm going to stop recording.